I'm delighted to be joined today by Nick Train from the Finsbury Growth and Income Trust. So Nick, thank you ever so much for your time. It's great to talk to you. Um, that is a pleasure. Thank you for your interest and any viewers' interest as well. How was 2022 for you as an investor? I know it's been quite difficult for lots of people. Um, I'm sure everyone's in the same boat. It's very challenging. Have you found it sort of hard year? And, and what do you sort of think of Finsbury Growth and Income's performance for the period? Well, I haven't yet given up on the year. <laughs> 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 there's still the santa claus rally to come let's let's pray um i i i i think it's you know as as i'm sure your viewers will I, it's irrational to think about investment in discrete 12 month chunks that just happen to coincide with you know the calendar but but um yeah i mean having said that what would i say um yeah, my my NAV for Finsbury is a couple of percent behind benchmark year to date. And that wouldn't fuss me too much, except for the fact that last year I was also a few percent behind the benchmark. So I've got two back to back years, potentially, barring the Santa Claus rally, where I may we may fail to meet our minimum aspiration. Our minimum aspiration is to try and do better than the FT All Share Index. So, so, so there we are. Yes, I maybe I do feel a bit disappointed. Um, I, I, I would like to point out um, b because I think it is important that during the course of the year the investment trust has increased its dividend paid to shareholders by wait for it and it, it's not a dramatic number but it's increased its dividend by six percent over last year and in the context of um unquestionably difficult times in markets and in economies and there's no doubt about that I at least was reassured that the underlying earnings power, the dividend paying power of this portfolio that we've constructed remained at least, you know, pretty resilient in what probably isn't anybody's favourite calendar year, 2022. So maybe that's maybe that's what I would say. Um, okay. Everybody needs to aim off for you know, nervous fund managers like me trying to defend the indefensible, possibly. I don't know, but that's that's my take on it. Hmm. I know that a lot of investors this year have been looking for companies that got pricing power, so the ability to pass on extra costs to customers without hurting demand. And I know that you invest in stocks like Unilever. Now, that's been putting up its prices, but earlier this year, it did say that sales volumes we're beginning to slow because it's some signs of shoppers switching from the branded goods to own label products. So would you prefer companies in your portfolio um, to think of themselves in terms of when they're making that decision to put up prices or should they think about the customer? So I guess another way to phrase it is, you know, would you be happy that um, that they're raising prices to protect their profit margins, but actually do you think that it perhaps would be better in the current circumstance, to keep prices flat and stomach lower margins so that more people could afford their products? Well, listen, um, if, if, I, I don't care whether you're Unilever or you're Louis Vuitton, you, you, you know, to take another extreme, you know, a luxury company. Mm. You, you've got to always offer value in the eye of your customer because if you're not offering that sense that I'm getting a fair deal for the product that I'm buying, then your business, your business is 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 doomed. And I, I don't think there's any any doubt. Uh, you're, you're quite right. I mean, the the volatility and that's a weasel word. The strongly rising input costs in the first half of 2022. Interestingly, they're easing off now. 
they are easing off. But that presented a lot of companies in a lot of sectors with a big challenge. How much of those input price increases should they pass through to their underlying customers? I don't know the answer to that. You know, I'm not the chief executive or on the board of the it's it's a it's a very, very complex question. But but to the extent that we've got any um, advice to offer to, to boards of companies, it would be to keep focusing on value for money in the eyes of your customers. I think if you get product improvements um, uh, 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 and even a business like Unilever is constantly working on ways to improve the quality of the product, of the packaging, then I think that's that that that's fine as part of the the overall um, the the overall corporate uh, corporate ethos. Um, yeah, that's what I'd say. Okay. Also, we had the news that Unilever's CEO Alan Joe will leave next year. A lot of people think that's a good decision. Where do you stand on that? Uh, and uh, you, have you been? Were you? having any discussions perhaps when he was still comfortably in that role that perhaps he wasn't the right person for it? No, absolutely not. Um, listen, I mean, I, my, my view on this is it's it's the old Napoleon quip, you know, give me lucky generals, give me lucky generals, give me a lucky chief executive, because all of these are extremely talented hardworking, motivated people who've become chief executives because they've been enormously successful previously in their career. Alan Jope built Unilever's personal care division from, I don't know, I'm slightly picking the numbers, 10% of total group sales to over 30% of groups. It's been an incredible creation of wealth for Unilever shareholders over the 30 years he's been at that company. But no one's going to de deny, and I'm sure Alan wouldn't deny, over the period of being chief executive, a lot of stuff has happened and been thrown at him. And as I say, maybe Alan's been unlucky. Um, but I think investors over-exaggerate their impressions of the calibre of, of people who run companies. Almost anybody who gets to the top of a major corporation is talented and hardworking. From that point on, though, luck plays a part. That's what yeah. I would say. Do you think we'll see a massive change to Unilever, the way it's in terms of its strategy when they do get a new CEO? Well, I, I, I hope not, um, because I think that. Unilever has continued to do the job for its customers, and we're talking about that, but, but also for its shareholders. Unilever's by and large continued to do the job that one hoped for and expected from a business of its. You know, Unilever is not the most exciting company on the planet. You know, it's not even the most exciting company in the UK stock market. It's probably not even the most exciting consumer product company in the UK. But li listen, the way I look at Unilever, you know, since, since the start of this century, you know, January the 1st, 2020, uh, sorry, 2000, <laughs> this century, 2000, Unilever's share price, it's, it's kind of quadrupled. It's quadrupled. Um, as it happens, the all share is only up 20% over the same period. So actually, Unilever so far this century has absolutely crushed the, the market. And it's done that by steadily growing and persistently earning strong returns on, on its capital. Um, I, I think if you look at Unilever's results this year, you'll see a confirmation of that underlying resilience and predictability. I, I sincerely hope that whatever changes are brought to bear on Unilever, and maybe some are necessary, I, I sincerely hope that they we don't lose us as investors in the UK stock market. I sincerely hope that we don't lose a company of this 
breadth, resilience, predictability, because they're rare and they should be, if not a bedrock, they probably should be part of almost anybody's investment portfolio. Okay. So Burberry is one of your other holdings. I mean, there's quite a few issues with this company. Um, I guess the first thing is change of CEO earlier this year, more recently change in the chief designer. Um, Does that raise a question about future strategy? And I guess the other thing is that Chinese sales perhaps aren't as strong as they could be because China's continued COVID lockdowns. Are you? Do you feel that this this company is perhaps doing the best it can at the moment? But you know, you could its full potential is yet to be sort of unleashed in terms of um, modern new look Burberry. I certainly, I certainly concur with the latter part of what you've said. I, 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 I believe that the future potential for the brand within the context of the whole luxury industry continuing to 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 grow i i i i think you know to 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 use the cliche the best is yet to come for burberry no no doubt about it i mean people people say to me oh you know burberry's got this big exposure to china you know it's like an achilles heel of the company i mean i just don't see that i mean this is this is a UK company where 40% of its sales come from Chinese nationals, whether those sales are in China or from Chinese tourists around the world. I mean, that's an extraordinary market position that this iconic, particularly trench coat has in the minds of one of the most dynamically growing parts of the world. To me, that's not a weakness. Okay, it hasn't helped in 2022, but so what? It's only one year in. Burberry's, you know, Burberry's 170 years old. One year with a bit of COVID in China doesn't make any difference, or it shouldn't make any difference. Um, Again, you know, I, I... Forgive me for looking back, but I think it's so important when people are so focused on what happened over the last six months or what might happen over the next six months. Burberry listed its stock on the London Stock Exchange in 2002 Mm. at a price of about £1.80. £1.80. Do you know what price it is today? Not off the top of my head, no. What? Okay, so at £21 today. Yeah, wow. So it's up 11 fold since it listed in 2002, 11 times increase. Now, why is that? Why is that? It's, it, is, it is because the Burberry brand is a truly resonant global luxury brand. And luxury is a growing category. There's no end to that in sight. And I don't know whether Burberry shares will be 11 times higher in another 20 years' time, but I don't see any reason why they shouldn't be. Okay. I mean, what what about the, um, you know, bringing in the new chief designer? Do you think that's that will change what the company does much or just bring a different sort of a, well, I guess, more of, you know, the, the focus is more on Britishness, isn't it, going forward? So. Purportedly. I mean, it's too, it's too soon to say. I mean, you know, I... <sighs> Again, I mean, you're going to think that this is, is complacent, but but in a sense, you know, if you've got any perspective on the history of companies in general, you, you chief executives, design chief designers, that in every business they they sort of change every five or six years for whatever reason, you, you know, and sometimes they can make a big difference, but normally. The reality is, if you're fortunate enough to own, in Unilever's case, Dove Soap or Hellman's Mayonnaise, it doesn't matter whether it's Alan Joke running the business or his predecessor or his successor. You own these incredible brands. You can screw it up a bit or you can make it a bit better, but probably from an investor's point of view, you're not going to make that much of an impact. I wouldn't say so with Burberry, we're very interested to see what the new designer brings to the table. But he's a lucky guy because the Burberry trench coat is an iconic, iconic 
piece that is going to be being bought and worn around the world in 50 years time. And that's what as investors, you should really care about. Okay. So another one you're holding is Relks. Um, shares have had a fantastic run between 2012 and 2021. But over the last year, not 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 as good, I guess it's, you know, it's been caught up in this sort of derating, perhaps or, or sell off in, in perceived growth stocks. What do is that do you feel that it, this is just a derating case it's not that its earnings have gone into reverse or anything no 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 I, 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 absolutely not i mean and listen i mean it's it's performing in line with the ftl share this year it's, it's it's not having a terrible year by anybody's definition um oh you know um th- th- this is the thing to say about about relex um, and I, I, you know, and I might, by extrapolation, I, I, it, I'd say the same thing about the big holdings that we have in London Stock Exchange uh, or, or in Experian as well. And this is what I would say: the UK economy, for whatever reason, I don't truly understand it, has failed to produce uh, uh, a Google or a Meta, or, or, or a Tesla even. Somehow we failed to capture this new wave of digital technology growth. And it's a shame because it's it's turned everybody against the UK stock market. And anyway, anyway. But that doesn't mean that there aren't some very, very significant UK corporations that are doing important things with digital technology and doing it better than any company of their type anywhere else around the world. And Relex is one of those companies. Relex, as you know, it's whatever it is, it's a it's a £40 billion pound company. It, you know, that's a major company by pretty much anybody's standards. And the reason that it's such a substantive business is because Relex is the best provider of uh, data and software tools to the academic community. It's the best provider of software tools and data to the legal community, to the insurance community, and generally to the risk community. It is a truly world-class business that is superior even to the best companies doing similar things on NASDAQ. That, that's true. And my goodness, those are rare in the context of the UK stock market. And I, I, I find it incredible that anybody wouldn't own Relex in a UK portfolio. Probably I find it incredible that anybody wouldn't own Relex in a global portfolio because it is a globally substantive, important company with fantastic business economics and an accelerating growth rate. Just going back to your question, are the good times over for Relex? Well, I, you can't legislate for the share price, but the most recent set of results from this company showed that growth was actually picking up relative to where it's been over the last three or four years. So obviously growth is a key part of your investment style, but I think to the average investor, that when they say growth stocks, they're thinking unprofitable tech names that could grow really fast in the future but um you know perhaps burning through cash now so what what sort of growth should someone expect from a typical stock in your portfolio is it more like five to ten percent annual earnings growth and not the sort of 30 40 you might get with some you know pure tech play those those pure tech plays i mean as you and i know and sadly, as a lot of investors have been reminded over the last 12 months, you know, so many of them grow at 30% for three or four years. And then, as you perhaps imply, don't grow at all for the next three or four years. And maybe maybe that's it. You know, they're like fireworks. They zoom up and then they crash down. And if you're a very smart trading-oriented investor, maybe you can capture that meteoric rise and get out before the thing implodes. I know I'm not smart enough to do that, and I don't try to do that. I'm much, much more interested in identifying 
businesses, business models that have got durability, predictability, as well as a growth opportunity. Um, I, I agree with you. It does defend, depend what your definition of growth is. I, I think, I mean, for us, and it's, it's just for us, although I'm sure other people would agree, a useful definition of a growth company is a company that earns uh, a return on capital year in, year out of, let's say, anything above 10%. You, you, you know, if a business is consistently generating high returns on its capital employed, then it's going to grow. You know, it's going to grow. Um, and, yeah, we, are, we own a lot of companies in Finsbury's portfolio with returns on capital of between 15 to 30%. And all other things being equal, and they never are, but all other things being equal, if you own businesses that have returns on capital of 15 to 30%, over time, those will be the underlying returns that you earn as, a, as an investor. Mm. So, you know, and again, I, 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 bull markets spoil people and making money quickly spoils people. We, we, we've got to recognise, sadly, that we inhabit an uncertain, uncaring universe. And actually, protecting the value of your capital adjusted for inflation, that's already quite a demanding hurdle. And my advice to any investor is think about constructing a portfolio out of assets that to begin with, you think have got a good chance of protecting you against the vicissitudes of fortune and particularly inflation. If you can get some growth on top of that, then that's fantastic. Um, so, you know, Diageo is is our biggest holding, you know, uh, and Diageo's core brands, key brands are you know, the second biggest brand by volume in the company, Guinness, that's 270 years old. You know, that, that survived. That's, and do you know what? Guinness is still growing. Uh, probably Guinness will be more profit profitable and sell more volumes of the stuff in 10 years' time than it is today. That, to me, it's not the only way to play this investment challenge, but to me, owning assets like that that you know are going to be around, but that still have the potential to find new customers, that, that's the way we try to do it. Okay. So obviously with, with stock markets sort of falling back in general in 2022, has that created any opportunities for you to take a new position in your portfolio or... Have you perhaps looked at existing holdings um, and sort of taken advantage of lower prices to top up your positions? Well, it's been the latter. Um, we 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 have we've had some weak share prices in our portfolio, my portfolio this year. I mean, you know, to my chagrin, the the only plus point about weak share prices is it does give you the opportunity to buy more of a good thing so long as you're convinced you know, that it is a that it is a good thing i mean we i mean fever tree is is a case in point i mean i i must admit i i started buying fever tree in i think 2020 and the price had already more than halved from its peak <laughs> and I thought when I started buying it, well done, Nick, you bought this way below the peak. Th th you know, this, this is probably the bottom. Well, sadly not. Fever Tree has hit new lows in early 2022. Um, but, you know, rightly or wrongly, let's hope rightly, the conviction that we have that Fever Tree is going to replicate the success it's had in the UK globally. And that if it does, Fever Tree is going to be worth many, many times, many fold higher in terms of market value than it is today. We've had a we've had an opportunity to put even more capital into Fever Tree at lower prices, um, and that's been the tendency. 
Um, there's there always is a reserve bench for what for what we're doing. I mean, you know, I've got a team of people working with me. They're always generating interesting ideas, but all of us. And, and again, I'm, I don't know if I offer this as advice, but I think it's important. Um, most often, the best investment idea is to buy more of what you currently own. Most often it is, because if you're constantly buying new holdings, ugh, you know, you lose focus, you lose faith in what you held in the first place. To buy a new stock, something that you already own you must have have less confidence in and that's a worrying a worrying symptom in my mind so for choice we're always looking to find value in what we currently own and you're absolutely right you know the horrible uk stock market particularly over the last two or three years and we run a UK fund. I mean, I, the, 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 there's more value in my portfolio, of course, in my personal opinion, than I can remember. I, I, and so we'd we, we love to add to the existing holdings. And just finally, what obviously I, I know you take a long term outlook on things, but, you know, we're moving into 2023. Do, do you feel slightly more optimistic about general market conditions or you know, it's going to be another sort of perhaps tough period and just a, a, a the perfect time for people to show that they can be patient investors. Please be optimistic. Please always be optimistic. Because if you're not, you you, you will make dismal choices. Um, I, 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 I cannot predict the future. Um, I can tell you that... Over the 70 years of the reign of Queen Elizabeth II, over that 70-year period, the UK stock market went up two and a half thousand times mm -hmm. over that 70-year period. Over the same period, inflation was up only 20 times. So the UK corporate sector, admittedly over a time horizon that's longer even than mine, 70 years, but it delivered against savers hopes for protecting the value of their capital against inflation and some growth on top and i see no reason to expect that to to change over time whether we get it all next year or two years and i haven't the faintest idea but you you've got to be positioned in the market to participate well, perfect. Well, Nick Train from Finsbury Growth and Income Trust, thank you ever so much for talking to you. It's been really good. You're very kind. Thank you. Before you go, please remember this podcast is for educational purposes and the views expressed don't necessarily reflect those of AJ Bell or Shares Magazine. The podcast isn't telling you whether certain investments are suitable or not. And don't forget that the value of investments can change and you can lose money as well as make it. It's also important to remember that tax rules apply and that the way an investment performed in the past may not be the same as how it behaves in the future. If you want help, go see a qualified financial advisor. Mm -hmm.